first question says which of the following is present on the beta subunit of the sodium potassium ATPase pump? So if you look at the sodium potassium ATPase pump, this is a hetero, this is a heterodimer. There are two subunits. A dimer would mean there are two subunits, alpha and beta, and they are different from each other. Right. So let us see what are these, what are the binding sites present on the alpha and the beta subunit. Now this is the smaller one which is beta. Alpha is the larger one which has a molecular weight which is almost twice the size of the beta subunit. Right. So this is the cell membrane here. This is the cell membrane here the ECF and the ICF. The alpha subunits have got three binding sites. Alpha subunits have got three binding sites on the inside. And which are these three binding sites? There is the sodium binding site, the ATP binding site, and the phosphorylation site. Phosphorylation site. What is the phosphorylation site? Now, the sodium potassium ATPase pump has got ATPase activity. It will break down the ATP to form ADP plus inorganic phosphorus plus energy. And that inorganic phosphorus will go to the phosphorylation site. There are two sites on the alpha subunit towards the outside, and that is for potassium, the potassium binding site, and the uabane binding site. Uabane is a plant glycoside. In fact, digitalis is derived from uabane, and uabane will inactivate the sodium potassium pump. Remember, remember, the sodium potassium pump will pump out three sodium. Sodium move from lower to higher concentration, from inside to outside, and this pump will bring in the potassium. So, Potassium also is moving from in, from outside to, uh, is moving from a, a lower to a higher concentration from outside to inside, right? Three sodium are pumped out of the cell and two potassium are pumped into the cell. So as you can see, all the binding sites are primarily on alpha. When you look at the beta subunit, beta subunit is a glycosylated protein and it has got three extracellular glycosylation sites. So if you see this over here, which of the following are present on the beta subunit? Sodium, phos sodium binding site, phosphorylation site, uh, ATP binding site are present on alpha. Glycosylation site is present on the beta subunit. Beta is a glycosylated protein. Let's look at the next question. Now, this is a uh, this has got a longer stem. It's a uh, uh, it's sort of it's it's a clinical and an applied question. So let's see this. A sixty five year old avid male hiker resident of Manali was hiking in Sikkim with two companions. They hiked to Nathula in Sikkim at. Uh, 12,000 feet in one day. Now climbing up to 12,000 feet, more than 10,000 feet uh, in one day, you're more likely to go into acute mountain sickness. So let's see what has happened. And he suddenly complained of extreme tiredness. There's a lightheadedness. There is a dizziness, difficulty in breathing. He began coughing and complained of tightness in the chest. So there are some, uh, there are definitely some cerebral symptoms. There are some pulmonary symptoms. He was taken to the emergency of local hospital. Examination revealed respiratory rate of 32, heart rate of which is higher, tachycardia. There is increase in blood pressure. There is a bluish discoloration of the fingertips, crackles, V's on the right lower lobe. His extra chest was done and this is what it looks like indicative of a pulmonary edema right so basically the question says which of the following is not a possible reason for the man's condition so basically asking you about the pathogenesis of pulmonary edema so let's have a look at this very briefly when you are when a person goes into high altitude in high altitude, because the atmospheric pressure is very low, there is a tendency to go into what is known as hypoxic hypoxia. Atmospheric pressure is very low, so the atmospheric partial pressure of oxygen is very less, and the patient goes into a hypoxic hypoxia. When I say hypoxic hypoxia, there is a decrease in PO2, there is also a decrease in the hemoglobin saturation. Both are reduced. There is a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, there is a decrease in the oxygen content of the blood. Now hypoxia, hypoxia will uh, uh, stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors. It stimulates the peripheral chemoreceptors. Yes, and they will increase the rate and depth of ventilation. And where there is, when there is an increase in the rate, of, rate and depth of ventilation, which is known as hyperventilation, that means there is increase in total ventilation and increase in alveolar ventilation, it tends to produce what is known as a CO2 washout. And uh, CO2 washout would result in a condition which is known as respiratory 
alkalosis. Hyperventilation will result in respiratory alkalosis. Now, the moment there is alkalosis, alkalosis in fact will start inhibit the peripheral key, start inhibiting the peripheral chemoreceptors. It will start suppressing the respiratory drive. And that is not what we want, isn't it? Because in high altitude as it is, there is less oxygen in the atmosphere. You want that the individual's respiratory drive to increase so that there is more, so that the supply of oxygen to the tissues can be maintained. But here is a situation now, there is a condition of an alkalosis which has happened and that alkalosis starts suppressing the respiratory drive. To overcome this, the, uh, uh, the, there is a process of acclimatization which takes place. Acclimatization which takes place and the, there, is, there will be now a renal compensation. There is an increased renal excretion of bicarbonates which will try to correct this alkalosis so that the respiratory drive can be maintained. Right? And the time taken for acclimatization is about 48 to 72 hours. Right? There is an increased renal excretion of bicarbonates which will try to, um, uh, like I said, uh, correct the alkalosis. Yes, so that the hypoxia can stimulate the respiratory drive. There are other things also which happen in acclimatization. There is increased secretion of erythropoietin to increase the red cell mass and the hemoglobin so that the oxygen carrying capacity can increase. Even at the tissue levels, uh, tissue level, there is an increase uh, cap increase in the capillary density, there is increase in the number of mitochondria in the tissues. So all that will, is a process of acclimatization. But sometimes this acclimatization does not happen properly and the patient goes into or sometimes when he, uh, see when you go to high altitude, uh, the, the individual is told not to undertake any undue physical exercise during the first 72 hours. First 72 hours he has to stay within his inside his hotel room, right? The reason is because this is the time taken for acclimatization. And during that time, if there is an increased demand for oxygen, for example, by exercise, uh, the ventilatory respiratory system cannot, uh, cannot supply that extra oxygen. So he goes into mountain sickness, yes? So acute mountain sickness, uh, will happen if there is a problem with acu with acclimatization or like I said, if there is physical exertion, exercise has been undertaken, some, uh, undertaken in the first 72 hours when he was forbidden to do so. Now what happens in acute mountain sickness? Firstly, what is the time taken? How much is the time taken for acute mountain sickness? Usually one to three days and um, in most cases after the first 24 hours. Right? One to three days and after the first 24 hours. Two, uh, the acute mountain sickness could be a very mild form of the disease where there is a headache, there are sleep disturbances, or it could also be a very, very serious form of the disease and that is uh, high altitude cerebral edema. There is a high altitude cerebral edema and or a high altitude pulmonary edema. Now, why is there a high altitude cerebral edema? Now, remember, hypoxia is a very potent stimulus for causing a vasodilation. So, this causes a cerebral vasodilation. Cerebral vasodilation, which increases the, if you, if, if there is a vasodilation, there is more flow. More flow would mean there is a more, uh, there is an increase in the hydrostatic pressure of the cerebral capillaries, which in turn increases the tissue fluid formation. This will increase the tissue fluid formation, right? Now, uh, so high altitude cerebral edema is, uh, is seen as a part of acute mountain sickness. How does high altitude pulmonary edema happen? Now, remember hypoxia, hypoxia causes a pulmonary vasoconstriction absolutely opposite effect to the cerebral blood vessels. This is producing a vasoconstriction. The response is different because there, because there are different channels which are present in the cerebral blood vessels and in the pulmonary blood vessels. So here there is a pulmonary vasoconstriction which is happening in the lungs and a vasoconstriction means there is no question of edema, right? Because here it's, it's something opposite to what, what you saw in the cerebral capillaries. So there is a catch here and the catch is this pulmonary vasoconstriction is uneven and patchy. 
this is uneven and patchy. There are areas where there are blood vessels are much more severely constricted as compared to other areas. So what happens is, if there is, if this branch is severely constricted, what will happen to flow into the other branches of this vessel? There is an increased flow. So there is going to be an increased flow to those areas where to those areas where the vasoconstriction is less severe, where blood vessels are less constricted. Yes, so there is an increased flow to those areas where the blood vessels are less constricted. Right, so that means what will happen in these blood vessels will be increase in the hydrostatic pressure of the capillaries uh, capillaries in these areas which will lead to an increase in the tissue fluid formation now one thing that you have to remember here is the hypoxia also increases the capillary permeability and that capillary permeability is also contributing to the edema Right. So let's have a look at this question. Now, this question said that uh, what is not a uh, not a mechanism for the uh, for the man's condition? Hypoxia induced vasoconstriction of pulmonary capillaries. Yes, there is a vasoconstriction of the pulmonary capillaries, but this vasoconstriction is patchy and uneven. Right. Areas where the uh, Within the areas that uh, within the lung, there are areas where the basic constriction will be more severe, and other areas where it is less severe. So it's patchy and uneven. Increased pressure on the pulmonary capillary beds. Yes, there is also an increased hydrostatic pressure to those areas where the flow is more. Disruption of the endothelial barrier resulting in leakage of fluid and proteins into the alveoli. Yes. So hypoxia causing vasodilation no vasodilation is not possible in the pulmonary capillaries it is a vasoconstriction right so answer is d which is not a possible reason for the man's condition next question question number three a new seizure drug is being investigated that binds to and activates the gaba a receptors in the cns now when you say gaba gaba a receptors this is in gaba is an inhibitory neurotransmitter it is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and an inhibitory neurotransmitter will uh, produce a IPSP, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Inhibitory postsynaptic potential, that means it will produce a hyperpolarization. Right? So a researcher is using a microelectrode to measure the RMP of a neuron. He records an RMP of minus 70. Which of the following membrane potentials is likely to be recorded following exposure to the drug? It has to be a hyperpolarization. That means the potential has to become more negative. And the answer to that would be minus 75 millivolts. There are two neurotransmitters which are always inhibitory and that is glycine and GABA. Both of these will produce a hyperpolarization, an IPSP and a hyperpolarization in the postsynaptic neuron. Right? All right. The next. Which of the following is greater in an afterloaded muscle contraction as compared to a preloaded muscle contractions? Now, contraction period, relaxation period, height of contraction is more in preloaded but the latent period is more in the afterloaded muscle contractions so let's first have a look at what is preloaded and afterloading now when you look at preloaded you must understand first try and understand what is the definition of preloaded and afterloaded now preload is the load which acts on the muscle before it starts contracting that means it acts on a muscle in a relaxed state prior to stimulation and what is the afterload afterload is the load against which the muscle has to act this is the load that the muscle is trying to move or work against during stimulation so how do i create a preloaded state in an in the lab experimentally now this is the muscle at rest a load is attached here this load is acting on the muscle at rest and it is stretching the muscle at rest and then when you give a stimulus to the muscle the muscle goes into a contracted state, it lifts that load. In an afterloaded condition, the afterload is not acting on the muscle at rest. It is being supported on the floor or on the table or somewhere. It is not acting on the muscle at rest. And then when you give a stimulus to the muscle, the muscle will contract and lift the load. So the first one is a preloaded condition and the second one is an afterloaded condition. 
Now, when I compare the two types of muscle contractions, what do I get? The in latent period is less in preloaded, more in afterloaded. Everything else, contraction period, relaxation period, height of contraction, work done is more in preloaded and less in afterloaded. Right? So the answer to this question is only latent period is longer in the afterloaded muscle contraction. Uh, so that means basically which is more efficient, more efficient will be a preloaded muscle contraction, right? Let's look at question number five. A 30-year-old woman presents with progressive shortening of breath. Which of the following corresponds with chronic blood loss? What will happen in chronic blood loss? Chronic, cr chronic blood loss, there is definitely going to be a decrease in hemoglobin. If there is a decrease in hemoglobin, yes, there will definitely be a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood there is going to be a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood right there will also there is a decrease in the oxygen content of the blood but the important point that you have to see is what will happen to the dissolved oxygen dissolved oxygen in this case will be normal and what is dissolved oxygen po2 PaO2, small a here is arterial, so partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood will be normal because remember the dissolved oxygen is uh, will correspond with the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. So there is no problem with the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. Ventilation is normal, so alveolar PO2 will be normal, so arterial PO2 will also be normal. Hemoglobin will be reduced, but this hemoglobin will be normally saturated. Why is there a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity? Because of decrease in hemoglobin, not because of decrease in saturation, right? And oxygen content will also be reduced. So what will happen? The PaO2 will be normal, saturation will be normal, but the oxygen content will be reduced. So my answer to this question is A. Is Right now, let's have a look at certain conditions. Now, for example, I was just I was we just discussed this normal PO2, normal saturation, decreased oxygen content, chronic blood loss. This we've done. This is what the question was based on. Second situation: normal PO2, decreased saturation, decreased oxygen content. So this is typically seen if there's a decreased saturation, for example, carbon monoxide poisoning, methemoglobinemia, sulfhemoglobinemia, but the PO2 is normal. Let's look at the third question. Now here, there is a decrease in PO2, decrease in saturation, decrease in oxygen content. This is high altitude. I just discussed one question uh, on high altitude. Uh, PO2 is normal, saturation is normal, but increased oxygen content, condition will be polycythemia. So this is a very, uh, a very good chart which is taking care of a lot of your questions based on this concept. Let's look at the next question. Which of the following is expected to decrease the measured airway resistance? Decrease the measured airway resistance, that means which is causing a bronchodilation. It is causing a bronchodilation. Now, out of these, it's only the sympathetic stimulation which will produce a bronchodilation. Adenosine, histamine, cool air itself, these are all important bronchoconstrictors. They are producing bronchoconstriction. Right? So, answer to this is A. Next question, what is the lung volume at the end of a maximum expiration? What is the lung volume at the end of a maximum expiration? This is by definition the residual volume. The volume of air which remains in the lungs at the end of a maximum expiration is called the residual volume. Isn't it? At the end of maximum expiration, the airways tend, with forceful expiration, there is a tendency of the airways to collapse. So at the end of a forceful expiration, the airways are collapsed. And if the airways are collapsed, air gets trapped in the alveoli. Air gets trapped in the alveoli and that air which is trapped in the alveoli, this is known as the residual volume, right? Now, this is what is residual volume, right? The volume of air which remains in the lungs at the end of a maximum, at the end of a maximum expiration. What is functional residual capacity? This is the volume of air in the lungs at the end of a normal expiration. Understood. That includes, that is residual volume plus the ERV. But what is residual volume? Lung of, volume of air which remains in the lungs at the end of a maximum expiration. 